Hey, everyone. That was great. That was almost perfect <laughs> at the end there. Cool. So we're going to start with, um, I heard Andy took a selfie at the start of this. Uh, and we're going to one-up him. So we're going to do a video selfie of all of us. So what I want everyone to do is be happier than you've ever been in your life. <laughs> like smiles that seem like excruciating to keep on your face. And then everyone go crazy. OK, so we're going to do it. That's not crazy. Be crazy. Cool. That was completely unrelated to the talk. That was just for me. We're having like a little competition, and I just won it, I think. Cool. So we're going to talk about full stack anxiety today. What is that? We'll find out. So I'm going to talk about a bunch of things. First. Who is this guy up front? Who am I? What brought me here? Why am I speaking to you about this? Why should you listen to me? And uh, who let me in? <laughs> then we're going to talk about full stack anxiety. What is it? Why should you care? And you know, spoiler alert, it's not a great thing. Uh, and finally, since it's not a great thing, what can we do about it? How can we alleviate it? So start with me. <laughs> you can tell I rehearsed, right? Cool. So my name is Joel, and I am a unicorn. And say, hi, Joel. Hi, Joel. That's great. <laughs> or a purple squirrel, which is a term. Or a hybrid. You know, whatever you call one person who does two things. So basically, I'm a designer who codes. I've been doing both for probably as long as I can remember. And I don't really remember exactly how it started. I think I was 12 or so, and I wanted to learn Photoshop so I could make educational Counter-Strike posters <laughs> with gems of wisdom like, <laughs> and so 13-year-old me obviously had a lot to say. And this led me down to a path to um, forum signatures and digital art sites and other things I thought were good at the time, but you know, in hindsight, clearly weren't. And just like that, I was a designer. At least, I thought so. I was so genuinely proud of these creations that I wanted to showcase them online. Now, around the same time, this site was really big. <laughs> Has anyone heard of Neopets? Yes. yes. Yeah, a surprising amount of people learned to design and code through this site. The basic premise of the site was caring for your virtual pets. But really, it was secretly crack cocaine for nerdy preteens. <laughs> I remember checking this obsessively during family vacations. Anyway, Neopets let kids customize their pet pages using HTML. And people really loved custom stuff back then. Remember, MySpace was basically the polar opposite of what Facebook is today. So people made pet pages like this, or this, or this, or, or whatever this is. <laughs> and around the same time, GeoCities was also really big. It let anyone, as this demonstrates, have a website. So yesterday's internet was really great at creating developers. There was less to consume, and so way more incentive to create the content online. And there weren't as many tools with which to create the content, almost no tools at all. So there was more incentive to learn the basic building blocks of the web, like HTML. So I did what any sane person would do and spent the next couple of years making really shitty websites, like this one. Who's had this exact website? <laughs> exactly like your corner and your blog and whatever, your page full of buttons, and this one, and this grungy piece of shit. <laughs> and just like that, I was a web developer. Again, at least I thought so. So at this point, I think I am an amateur designer and developer. Amateur being a nice word for really almost insultingly bad at both. So for the next decade, I spent a lot of time growing in both directions. On the design side, I like, I like how big that hot air balloon is over here. So on the design side, I learned the classics like Corel Draw and Photoshop, Fireworks, Illustrator, and then After Effects for motion graphics. On the visual side, I got better by learning color theory, typography, grid systems, and then getting better by copying what I saw, so grunge and Web 2.0 and any other trend. And on the dev side, at the same time, I, grow, I grew from front page 
Any front page fans here? To like more senior text editors like Dreamweaver. <laughs> I grew from table-based HTML to Flash, who's had a, a kind of shameful Flash period in their life. Not shameful. Shameful. <laughs> cool. So I built websites with tables and Flash, CSS, JavaScript, and then I learned TextMate, some back-end languages, and so forth. So I'm getting a little bit better each day, and at some point, I'm, I mean, all this time, I'm also freelancing and creating shitty album covers and posters and websites, and at some point, I joined a web agency as a visual designer. So I still sucked, and at some point, I reached the level of, you know, uh, conscious incompetence, right? that Ira Glass quote of like, I had the taste, but I really couldn't pull it off. So I figured I should probably actually learn some of this stuff and maybe pick up a real one of these while I'm at it. But even though I was working as a designer at this point, I wasn't really sure what to call myself. So was I a designer or was I a developer? I was equally interested in both, and I never really spent much time thinking about titles. But if I wanted this fancy diploma, I needed to choose, right? Would it say communication design or would it say computer science? What would I even go to school for? But choosing was really hard, so I skipped it. Yeah, I found a program called Design and Technology in New York, which would teach me, you guessed it, both design and technology. And four years later, I was a hybrid, certified. So these days, I lead product design at DigitalOcean. For those of you who don't know, I mean, Yuna works there too, but it's an awesome company that provides simple cloud infrastructure for developers. Super interesting, right? No, it is. I really enjoy it. So at DO, I've done everything from strategy to UX to visual design to front end. So it was very in line with the path I set on over a decade ago. So that's me in an eggshell. So these days, people usually know me as this sad, upside-down face guy. Hopefully, in real life, I'm less sad, less upside-down, and less a cartoon. So hello. But this talk isn't just about me, so everyone can let out their sighs of relief. It's about how to deal with being one of these, a unicorn, a designer who codes, or a full-stack developer, which more and more of us find ourselves becoming these days. So I'm going to focus on designers who code because that's what I am and that's what I can speak to, but I hope this can be as relevant to any kind of hybrid. So if you're a full-stack developer, if you're a developer who designs, if you're an illustrator who runs a business, or maybe a designer who started managing, I hope this can hit home for you. Or maybe anyone at all currently working in our industry. So before I start whining, and consider yourselves warned, I'm about to start whining for a while, I want to say that we're extremely lucky we're basically working in the best profession on Earth right now. There are a ton of jobs in the intersection of design and tech. Right? It's a seller's market. It's preposterously in the favor of those of us with the right skills. But at the same time, and that comma right there is where I start whining, there are way, way higher expectations. So those of us who've been in the game for a while can remember that designers who code used to be rare. It used to be special. But these days, it's almost a requirement. There are more startups than ever before, and startups expect their employees to wear many hats. And what this means is becoming a hybrid is more important than ever. On top of that, the tech landscape is changing so rapidly, and there's a ton of pressure to be up to date on 100 different things at any given time. So I remember when the concept of T-shaped designers first became popular. Has anyone heard of this? A bunch of people? So this was popularized by Apple, I think. The horizontal bar represents a relatively shallow foundation in a lot of fields. Say, I know enough about information architecture, interface design, copywriting, lettering, and code. Right? And the vertical bar represents deep expertise in one field, say, in user experience specifically, while maintaining that shallow foundation in all the other fields. And the quote, I'm only hiring T-shaped designers, represents really disconcerting employer expectations. Because what they're saying is, I want a specialist, but one who can also do everything else. <laughs> right, so this doesn't sound easy, right? But it sounds doable. It sounds like we'll do nights and weekends, we'll spend some time, we'll get there. 
But let's consider that first, becoming an expert takes years. So Malcolm Gladwell famously said 10,000 hours. And that's even without juggling all these other skills simultaneously. And two, coupled with that, we have limited time. So if you spend, oh, can you hear me fine? Dope. Cool. So if you spend optimistically half of your time coding, illustrating, and writing, will you have the time to be the best UX designer you can possibly be? Will you have the time to read up on new design patterns to build personas or polish user flows, or ask the right questions during your user tests? So will you do your best work? And even if you somehow do, will you manage to stay amazing at that while also maintaining all of your other skills? Because remember, you weren't just hired for one of your skills. You were hired for all of them. And focusing on one means you aren't applying the rest. So being a unicorn is great, but having a horn on your head can get a little bit uncomfortable. Pause for laughter. And it's even worse. Actually, T-shaped designers are apparently not enough anymore. I'm never hiring T-shaped designers again. No one's ever said that, but <laughs> you get it. So the new hip thing, I shit you not, is a W-shaped <laughs> designer. This is real. This is like recruiters have talked to me about this. So now hiring managers are looking for designers who are experts in not just one, but two fields. That's what those, those bumps are. Say both visual design and experience design while maintaining that foundation and all the rest. So coding, lettering, et cetera. And what they're basically saying is, I want a person who can do absolutely everything. <laughs> so lame old T-shaped designers just can't compete. And this is kind of scary, right? How can we possibly live up to these expectations? And these are really big expectations. So let me take a drink of water. Sorry, it's all the way over here. This is super awkward. We're going to be talking about all the things now. So let's say I am a front-end developer. I'm expected to learn SVG animations, and Node, or React, or Ember, or Meteor, some kind of JavaScript framework, even though these are slightly different. BEM principles, get better at CSS, write more elegant code, get better at using the web inspector and all the new features, get better at sublime text, maybe finally learn Vim. But I'm also a visual designer, so I'm expected to stay up to date on trends like material or flat or skeuomorphic, maybe not so much skeuomorphic anymore, but once I did, and Photoshop and fireworks, sometime I did, but not anymore, I guess, and sketch, better typography, lettering, and illustration, and I'm a UX designer, so remote user testing, best practices for building personas, information architecture, Android or iOS design, some kind of mobile thing, Pixate or Framer, I need to learn how to actually make the things I'm doing. I, I make them move. I don't want to be an obsolete, so maybe 3D environments. I don't want to be a 2D designer where all the kids are 3D designers, right? And maybe Internet of Things. And I'm a manager, so leadership training is good one-on-ones and giving feedback, accountability discussions, building paths, job sculpting. And I'm a teacher, so curriculum building best practices for getting people to learn. And I'm a consultant, so negotiations and contracts and setting up a business. And I'm a human being, right? So I can't possibly learn all of these things. So what do I choose? Do I become a better front-end developer, or a better UX designer, maybe a better manager? What's more important to me? What's going to be better for me in the future? And if I choose to focus on visual design, do I get better at illustration? Or do I learn sketch and get better at UI design? Right? The choice isn't easy, because I'm not just choosing what to learn here. I'm also choosing what not to learn, where not to grow. So most of the people we call unicorns are either designers who kind of code or developers who kind of design. In most cases, every choice to grow in one discipline is also a choice not to grow in another. And these are important life-influencing decisions. There's not always a clear winner. Right? All of these skills are relevant in some way to my day-to-day. -day. They'd all be useful, but I still need to make a decision. What will I be able to bring to the table in a year? What's going to be my stack? So to illustrate this, let's use a spider graph, because everyone loves spider graphs. I love them. You love them. On this, we agree and are friends. <laughs> so this is you. This represents your stack right? in this hypothetical scenario. So here you are, like, try to put yourself in these shoes, OK? If, cool. So here you're a UX heavyweight. Right? You're really solid at front-end development. And on top of that, you can design interfaces relatively well. 
right? So you're what people usually call a unicorn. And you also have some teaching skills, but it's kind of irrelevant. What you were really hired for was user experience, visual design, and front end. These three. So let's say, in this hypothetical scenario, that you just transitioned into managing your team. Right? You think to yourself, oh shit, I'm leading a team of designers right now, and I have no idea what I'm doing, as many new managers do. So your priorities have shifted. So OK, no more fiddling around with JS or Sketch. Got it. So let's do that. Let's grow as a manager. Let's do the training. Let's read the books. But as you spend time on this, you're not putting time into the rest of these skills. You're not learning new UI stuff, UX, or code stuff. And worse, you're not practicing as much. So they shrink a bit. It's inevitable. And what used to be this, AKA you, is now this. But more importantly, these, the skills that got you the job in the first place, the skills you are hired for, now look like this. And what that means is that getting a job in the future with those same skills is going to be much harder. On the other hand, this, management, now looks like this, which means you have a better chance at getting design leadership positions, if that's what you want. If you made other decisions, your skill set could also become this. Now you're a specialist. You're an industry expert in UX if you spend all your time on it. Or this, if you found yourself focusing more on development instead of design. So what I'm saying is that every decision you make matters a lot. The stakes are real. What's going to make you successful? What's going to make you happy? So a simple question like this, what do I learn, can become really scary. So let's take a look at some of that list again. Do I learn sketch, or SVG animations, or origami? <laughs> or Meteor, or get better at one-on-ones, better methodologies for user testing, typography, node, envision, accountability discussions, follow aesthetic trends on dribble, build personas, grunt, gulp, responsive patterns. <laughs> Every time I go through this list, I feel so anxious. And worse yet, it's actually 10 times as long in reality. And more importantly, is that going to make me this, or this, or this, or this? And what does that mean for my career? And what am I going to be next year? And is that what I want to be? And am I learning too much dev stuff for a designer? And am I a designer? Am I pigeonholing myself? Is this going to get me the jobs I want? What's going to make me happy? Where do I even start? <laughs> know that feel. So on their own, every single one of these options seemed great. But trying to choose between them, I'm suddenly riddled with self-doubt. Because I'm not just picking a new skill out of a bag. I'm picking a direction, a future. And it all comes down to this one dreadful question. Am I doing the right thing? So this is full stack anxiety. Who's experienced something similar? Pretty much everyone in the room. Yeah, it's the worst, right? It sucks. Cool, so that's my talk. Thanks so much. <laughs> No, I'm not an asshole. Uh, so let's talk about overcoming full stack anxiety. Six ways that I've found to personally deal with it. Some of these are actually going to be similar to stuff Alice just talked about, which is cool. Some very similar. Cool, I'm just going to leave this open. <laughs> That's going to end well. So number one, do the research. So I have this fun stressful list. But how'd I get it? So before you can make your own fun, stressful list, you need to understand the landscape. And I'm sure many of you already do. So this first piece of advice might resonate most with those of us who are just starting out. And well, I still hope that it can be useful to anyone stepping into unfamiliar territory. So in this example, the unfamiliar territory is the industry. The design industry, the engineering industry, the fashion industry, wherever you work, wherever you live. So this circle is you. I really like diagrams. So you may have just finished a boot camp or a degree, or maybe you just transitioned in from another field. Maybe you've been in this field for a long time, but you've been heads down for so long that you've lost touch. The bottom line is you're outside the current industry looking in. And it looks so nice in there. People seem so happy, they're smiling, 
and frolicking and rolling around in piles of money. And those could be your piles of money. You want to be part of it so, so badly. You just need to get your foot in the door. The problem with this visual metaphor is there is no door, right? There's just darkness. You don't know a clear way in, so you just take a stab. That's your stab. <laughs> so this stab is analogous to sending your CV to every job listing on Indeed or Monster or similar job sites. So you've made your first step into new territory, but it was uninformed. So now you're lost, alone, in the dark. <laughs> you aren't even sure what's out there, so you don't have a path to follow. And being lost sucks. It's scary and it's lonely. And not having a next step can really paralyze you. Even before you take that first step, what are you really supposed to do? What's the use of a first step if it's in the wrong direction? Now, how useful would it be just to kind of get a rough understanding of what's out there? Like that. So these might represent possible career paths or jobs that exist out there, some knowledge. How much, how much better does that feel, just generally understanding the lay of the land? And the more you learn about your field, the more precise your direction can be. Even if the actual path to it doesn't end up being what you thought it would be, at least it's possible to start moving in a general direction. So getting context for your industry won't ensure that you get what you want, but putting in the work and learning what's out there will give you so, so much confidence. It'll tell you where to search. It'll tell you what's possible. And knowing what's possible is the first step to figuring out what's right. It's what allows me to build this stressful list in the first place and freak out. Right? Once you understand what's out there, say by looking at actual job listings in your industry, you can figure out what you want. And then find out what's actually required to get there. You can look at requirements, for instance, and then build a list of skills from that. You can look for themes. So here it looks like general design principles, typography, and Adobe Creative Suite, right? If you're just entering the industry. For more senior individual contributor, so IC roles, you might have more experience in design systems, CSS frameworks, usability testing. For more experienced leadership roles, maybe you're looking for design recruiting, things like that. So this list is stressful. Right? Do we agree on that? But it's less stressful than this. Two, look at the big picture. And like Alice, this means asking yourself cliche questions like, where do I want to be in five years? So being thoughtful regarding who you want to go, who you want to be, goes a long way. Knowing what's out there is relatively easy, right? But figuring out what you truly want is quite possibly the hardest thing you'll do. Do you want to be a badass design leader? Maybe stay brushed up on UX, maybe get a bit better at business, but visual design and coding might take a back seat in this case. Or do you want to be the best UX designer you can possibly be? For this, you also have to ask yourself another question, which is, what kind of work do I want to do in the future? Because specializing can be really amazing for consulting or for joining big companies, but if you want that fast startup life, Right, where you need to wear a, hun a hundred different hats, it's not as great. What am I becoming by learning this? So by asking this question, my team at DigitalOcean stopped itself from becoming really tech heavy, which we were starting to become due to way too much time spent in the code base. We used to do all the front end, we used to fix all the bugs, we used to write tests as designers. That's kind of crazy. <laughs> Just making that note. And we brought ourselves back to a more rounded out design team with a larger focus on UX. So make sure you're asking yourself these really powerful questions and paying attention to the bigger picture. Be mindful of what you want long term and then let that understanding drive your decisions. Three out of six. So let's take a look at these options again. Do I learn Meteor or get better at one-on-ones, better methodologies for user testing, Gulp, Ember, SVG animations? Is making you anxious? Just me? <laughs> well, let's, let's act as though everyone's super stressed here. So the reason that all of these different things are making you anxious is twofold. First, they all seem like they have equal weight. So there's a lack of structure. 
they're not the same things or even necessarily in the same category of things, but they're all treated the same, and that's really disconcerting. You have all of these things to learn, but there's no way to tell what's more important. There's no way to compare them to each other. There's no way to look at the big picture. And when you treat all of the things you can learn the same way, the exact same way, they can get really overwhelming. Having a clear structure, on the other hand, can really alleviate that. Now, the second reason they might be making you anxious in this scenario <laughs> is that they're open loops. Has anyone heard of the concept of open loops? A few people? Two people? Cool. So, open loops is a term in psychology. It's pretty simple. It just means the things that are in your head that you need to do, but you haven't written down yet. Right? Pretty simple. Things in your head, you need to do them, but you haven't actually written them down on paper. So you can think of these as actual processes running in your head or psychic residue, right? Thoughts that are floating around in your head and stressing you out. So the more open loops you have, the less cognitive space is left. This is a real thing, and the more stressed out you are. By writing these downs, you're getting them out of your head. Your mind actually closes these loops and freed up, frees up that much needed space. This is real. Writing things down can make you less stressed. So as anxiety-provoking as this list is, it's better than a general vague panic. There might be a lot of things, but they're organized. And better yet, you don't have to keep juggling them inside your head. Four, take the decision out of the moment. So create a litmus test for things you should learn, an if-then rule for learning. This could be something like, if this skill is directly applicable to the jobs I want, then I'll learn it. Or, if the skill can be applicable to other parts of my life, if it can be like a two birds, one stone thing, then I'll learn it. If this skill would be in demand for years to come, if it's kind of a little future-proof and I don't have to keep learning new things, then I'll learn it. Or, my favorite, because I think it's the most powerful, if this brings me closer to who I want to be, then I'll learn it. This is why getting a feel for what you actually want long-term can be really helpful. So once you're done with that, which we are now, we're going to make a list of what we might want to learn. Remember, creating structure is super helpful. So I've jotted down this list, right? All of these things are really interesting to me, but I can't learn them all, and I want an actual reason for my decisions. Right? I don't want to just learn JavaScript and get better at that, because I happen to jot it down first. So let's pick some of those if-then rules from before to judge these with. So, if it'll be in demand for years to come, if it'll actually help me secure a job for the next couple of years, then I'll learn it. And, also, if this brings me closer to who I want to be, then I'll learn it. In this case, it's that design leader from before. Right? So these two rules. If it'll be in demand for years to come, and if it helps me become a design leader. Right? And these aren't necessarily universal. These are just things that I've chosen. You can choose your own rules based on what your priorities are in life. So let's color code these before we start rating the skills. So we're going to be actually rating these on the side. So we want a way to tell what's what. We can also weight our criteria based on its relative importance. So in this case, anything that can get me into design leadership positions is going to take precedence. Cool. And it's also we have a size difference now. So if you're colorblind, you're welcome. <laughs> or sorry for not doing more. Cool, so now we can start judging our list. Let's start with the first rule. So, as you can see, and as you might know, JavaScript and iOS development are pretty sought out, right? If you learn these things and get good at them, chances are for the next couple of years, the foreseeable future, you're gonna get jobs with those. User interviews and user journeys are also sought out right now. I don't know for how long, but hopefully for very long. And then Framer, actually being able to prototype the things you're doing is pretty important these days. And design recruiting is always important. Now, the rest of these things, so like Vim, getting better at Sketch, lettering, those things could definitely make you better at your job, right? They likely do. But what we're testing now isn't just like if we like those things and if these things make us better. It's whether these things are specifically going to be in demand, whether recruiters are going to look at your CV and be like, Yes, that's the person. So these get points. And now we can judge these by our second rule. If it helps me become a design leader, which in this case takes precedence. 
So user interviews and journeys, being able to model users is pretty important as a design leader, at least being able to lead a team in that. Budgeting one-on-ones and career paths also got points. Now, you might notice this, these didn't get points in the first one, right? And that's because these things, while they will 100% make you a better design leader, they're not things that are specifically sought out by recruiters. But they still get points here because this isn't about whether they're sought out. And design recruiting is always important. Trust me. So now we can reorder these based on the points that we gave them. So isn't that awesome? Right? We start getting an idea of what's more important to us. But we still can't learn all of this stuff. So let's bring in a more realistic list. Like anything analog, it always exists next to a coffee cup. <laughs> so this list only has six spots, because we, ha we don't have unlimited bandwidth as much as we'd like that. We can't learn all of the things. So we're setting it arbitrarily at six, because that seems maybe a bit more feasible. So let's move our top stuff over, like magic. We're going to learn design recruiting, building career paths, get better at one-on-ones, user interviews, user journeys, and get better at budgeting. Right? These things are in order of importance already. So you start with the first and move on to the next one. This is because I don't have time for everything. Right? These things on the left are going to make me better at my job. They're super interesting. Right? I want to learn them. But that's exactly why I have created this list. Right? I want to take the decisions out of my own hands so I don't keep stressing out and trying to learn those things. So let's focus on these and destroy those. Yeah, that feeling of power. <laughs> cool. So I'm left with a list of just the things that are important to me. And man, does that feel good. <laughs> it's so relaxing. I've gotten rid of a ton of cognitive load. I've made a list that basically thinks for me. So next time I hear about that cool new ebook, I won't buy it on a whim and then feel guilty for months about not actually reading it. Instead, I'll just blissfully do what the list tells me to do. All praise the mighty list. So Kierkegaard, because I needed at least one philosopher here, <laughs> said that anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. Right? And that rings true. Setting up a framework will mitigate that boundless freedom, and with it, your anxiety. Water time. Five out of six. Stop chasing trends. So we all know this story. Sketch kills Photoshop. React kills Angular. BEM kills OOX. And apparently functional CSS is already killing BEM. Adam kills Sublime. Rails kills PHP. And then JS swoops in and kills Rails. Right? <laughs> Some of you might disagree, but you know, whatever. And so forth and so on until the end of time. Right? There's always going to be a new thing. All of these tools are likely going to die at some point. So just use the tools that are convenient for you. Now, is that something new? Great. No? Still great. So don't worry about being an early adopter. Instead, get better at things that are tool agnostic. Now, this could be typography for designers or programming patterns. It could be user research, management, so forth. Right? If we look at this list, you can see that a ton of these things are tools. And I don't know how long these will last. Will they be around in a decade, for instance? Or am I slightly wasting my time? So prioritize, prioritize transferable skills. You want to build skills that aren't dependent on the now, the current tools, your current job. The more longevity a skill has, the better an idea it is to learn it. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, be happy. Right? And this is where Alice and I basically have the same talk. So remember, you only get one life, at least if you subscribe to the same belief system I do. And at the end of the day, that life isn't just about work. So about a year ago, when I first gave this talk, or some version of it, my work satisfied me completely. Right? Learning new tools and ways of thinking was challenging and fun, and growing as a manager was so, so fulfilling. But these things ebb and they flow. And I slowly became exhausted with the design industry, with hundreds of new things to learn and new ones popping up all the time, with new opinion pieces on Medium every day, right? with being laser focused on design and management day in, day out for so long, and with 
building the right sensible thing. Right? And I got to a point where I was running on empty. I imagine some of you know this feeling. Right? Product design wasn't giving me energy anymore, and I was completely burned out. I desperately needed something else. So I started working on a game with a friend, a Hollywood hacking roguelike, which is a, quite a mouthful, and I can explain what that is later if you catch me. So this game has me neck deep in maths and physics and Canvas performance and JS architecture. Right? I spend a good chunk of my time now watching gameplay videos and learning about mechanics. And the truth is, not a lot of this is directly applicable to my career in product design. Right? Not a lot of this is going to come back and help me as a designer. And something that took me a long time to come to terms with is that that's OK. Sometimes a job can just be a job. Sometimes you can take a break. Right? Rat races never made anyone happy. And it's a sad realization that we live in a culture where your career is expected to be your life. Where having enough engineering side projects, for instance, is a standard way of judging engineering candidates. As if we're expected to always be focused on our career rather than going on new adventures, working on our hobbies, spending time on our passions, or enjoying time with our friends. By the way, this is what you get when you search for millennials having fun. <laughs> it seems pretty accurate. So no, none of that. Instead, we have the expectation to always be growing, always stay up to date, always move forward towards our next goals, always compare yourself to every other person in the room. And these kind of expectations are unsustainable. They cause so, so much anxiety. And the simple truth is, whatever you end up learning, you'll probably be fine. Now, a friend I really admire, guess who, is Alison House. <laughs> So she was almost here this year, um, and if she had been, she would have had way nicer slides than mine. Um, so cross your fingers for next year. Makes sense, dope. It's awesome. Anyway, a few years back, House found a lot of success as a designer in tech, working at companies like Codecademy and Dropbox. And most people, including myself, would probably have stayed the course. But one day, she left. She hit that reset button you were talking about. And on her website, she writes, I spent my teenage years staying up until 5 AM engrossed in design and code, to the point where her dad had to shut off the internet to make her stop, but she kept coding locally. She asks, where did it go, the intensity of that wonder and curiosity? So two years ago, she picks up 3D for the first time. She calls it the best day of her adult life. And look at her recent work, right? Some of it you saw in Alice's talk. You can tell how much fun she's having, right? Now, House's talk is actually about producing this much work so quickly, or one of her talks. But you don't produce this much without being truly fulfilled. El Luna, another product design expat, also talks about this idea in her Crossroads of Should and Must, a medium post turned talk turned book in some order. But this is about the idea of choosing between what you should do and what you must do. She writes, should is how others want us to show up in the world, how we're supposed to think, what we ought to say, what we should or shouldn't do. It's the vast array of expectations that others layer upon us. And all of these skills are actually tied to the career trajectories. right? They conform to what our culture has taught us is the right path. They're what we should do. Now, must, on the other hand, is who we are, what we believe, what we do when we're alone with our truest, most authentic selves. They're the things that energize us, the things that keep us running. Now, this game, working on it, has been the most energizing thing I've experienced in the last year. Right? It puts me in a flow state where I'm fully immersed, I'm energized, I'm enjoying myself deeply and working for long chunks of time without even noticing time go by. So another question that's hugely important to ask is what puts you in flow? What gets you energized? What keeps you up until 5 AM? Now, this part might seem like it conflicts with the rest of the talk, which focuses squarely on should, but it doesn't need to. right? So yes, sometimes it is a trade-off. Happiness and success can adversely affect each other. 
And in these cases, you'll need to decide what you want to optimize for. But more often, I think this is a false dichotomy. Things that make you happy can also make you successful, like most of Alice's talk right before me, right? And it's up to you how to balance how you live. So work can and should be fun too. You're not a robot. You're not learning all of this stuff just to get ahead in life. If you ask me, your end goal should be a career that you're fully satisfied with, right? So do the things that make you happy. So another hugely important rule, or something that can be really legitimate, is if I really enjoy doing it, or if it keeps me up until 5 a.m., then I'll learn it. Do you love illustration? Do you love lettering? Do you love coding up your side projects? Right? Maybe what you really love is working at the bleeding edge. Maybe that's what makes you happy. Now, even if it's not a skill that's relevant to your current job, or one that'll directly help you, you should make time for the things you love. So find a way to build passion into your work. You can grow in your field and have fun while doing it. So these are the six. Do the research. Get the lay of the land. Understand how your industry works. Understand what exists out there. Use that knowledge to look at the big picture and get an understanding for what you truly want. Now use that understanding about yourself to create some structure. You can use that structure to take the decision out of the moment. Right? Stop chasing trends and prioritize your happiness. So if you've been listening, and I hope you've been listening, most of this stuff boils down to just being more thoughtful and intentional with your decisions, which is to say, don't just wing it. Right? Your career in its entirety deserves the level of care you put into each and every one of your projects. Your life in its entirety does. So put some time in and design it. Thanks so much.